All right, Psalm chapter 2. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings, pay attention now, the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying... Now, last week we did Psalm 1, right? And what was the main teaching out of Psalm 1 that I could probably... or one of the main teachings was that we shouldn't take counsel from the ungodly, right? It's, it's, it's going to ruin your life. Yes, the ungodly seem to be profitable in this earth. They seem to be doing well. You know, it's very tempting to take counsel from ungodly people, right? And so we're instructed not to do that. We're instructed to have good Christian friends, good Christian fellowship, good Christian influences in our life, so we would not partake in the ways of the world. And then what we see here in Psalm 2, in verse number 2, we see that the kings of the earth, the rulers, you know, the kings, the prime ministers, the presidents of the earth, those that are in high powers, those that rule this, this world, you know, some people call it the Illuminati, some people call it the Bilderberg Group, and, you know, some people have all these names. At the end of it, whoever it is that's pulling the strings, whoever it is that's pulling the strings of the presidents and the kingdoms of this, this world, at the end of the day, we know that on top of that food chain is Satan. We know that it's the forces of the devil, right? And so what we see here, and this is God. These are God's words. Okay, we take them seriously. God is telling us that the kings and the rulers of this world take counsel together. They get together and they, what do they say? They take counsel and get together against the Lord. Can you believe that? against God and against his anointed saying now we'll get that in a minute but one thing that you're going to be deceived in this world and look I'm not against government of course God has instituted government you know in our lives for a purpose right to punish evildoers it's something God wants you know to maintain order and for you know for evildoers to be punished there's, there's a purpose for government God has instituted that um, that gov government right his, his, that, that institution that's God's plan. But God is also telling us, hey, when these people get in power, they take counsel together against the Lord. They actually, on purpose, put laws into place, put rules into place that are against the Bible, that are against God, that are against His anointed. We'll find out who the anointed is in a moment. But they take league together. And quite often the media will portray the left and right paradigm, right? You know, like in Australian government, we talk about the Australian government, we've got the, the Labour government, they're, they're portrayed as the, as the left, they're portrayed as the, um, as the progressive, uh, you know, progressive in philosophy, progressive in politics, and then we get presented with the Liberal government, right, the Liberals. They're supposedly the Conservatives, they're supposedly the right wing. So the media likes to portray there's a right, right and left paradigm. But what does God say? They take counter together. You know, there's no such thing as left and right. They're, they're, they're in it together. They're working together. And probably the best example of that in our recent days is this same-sex marriage, is this homosexual marriage. You know, the, the reprobates, the uh, sodomites of this world now in Australia are legally allowed to get married. Now, under what government did that happen? Under the, the Liberal Party, right? Malcolm Turnbull is the Liberal Prime Minister. Under a Liberal government which is supposed to be conservative, which is supposed to be right-wing. It was a Labour Party that was pushing the gay agenda. But who brings it in? Who legalises it? The Liberal Party, the Liberal government. So if that doesn't prove to you that these guys are working together, I don't know what will. Yes, the media's going to portray they're in argument, they're fighting, so you can feel like you can choose one or the other. But God is telling us, no, they take counsel together. They're actually, I'm not saying every single person in government, don't get me wrong, but I'm just saying, as far as, you know, the powers go, that go and Satan that, that is actually pulling the strings at the end of the day, they're purposely bringing in laws into this country that are against God. And I want you to understand that. I want you to understand that, you know, this is, these are God's words. I don't have to tell you this. These are God's words. They take counsel together, okay? They're not on opposite sides as much as you think they are, okay? They do that to play the game. They do that so they can be elected. They do that so they can maintain their positions in government and make it seem like everything is legit and so on and so forth. But it's not. Okay? Now, they take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed. Now, who's His anointed? So it's against the Lord God and against His anointed. Now, I'm sorry if I'm going back to the Hebrew now, but that word anointed is um, the Hebrew word uh, Mashiach. Mashiach. 
Right? So the Hebrew word Mashiach is translated into English as anointed. Right? But what's the transliteration? Okay, so the English word for uh, uh, Mashiach is anointed, but the transliteration of Mashiach is Messiah. Okay, Messiah. So that's G- this is referring to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ the anointed, Jesus Christ the Messiah. These words are synonymous, they're the same thing. And then in Greek, what's the Greek word for Messiah and anointed? It's the, the Christ. Jesus Christ. So Christ means Messiah, means anointed. Okay? Now, uh, you know, the, the Bible uses all these three words, you know, uh, but it's a reference to Christ. They take counsel together against the Lord, against God, and against Jesus Christ. Now, what do they say in verse number three? Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. This is what the kings and the rulers of this world want. They want to break the bands of God's law. They want to cast away the things of God. They want to cast away biblical Christianity. They want to cast away the laws of God and the judgments of God and the righteousness of God. They feel restricted by that, right? Because even in this wicked generation, people still, there's still um, a respect for God's word, okay? There's still a respect for God. People still know the Ten Commandments. They still generally agree with those Ten Commandments, right? I mean, sometimes when you talk to people at the door, they're like, yeah, I'm trying to keep the laws of God, I'm I'm doing my best, you know. People still, and and, you know, you pull out your Bible, you show them things from the Word of God, people still respect that more than your own Word, okay? And yet we see the kings and the rulers, they want to get rid of this. They feel restricted. They feel they can do more for the world if they get rid of God's Word, okay? They're against the laws of God. They're purposely working together to come against God. They're seeking to destroy the laws of God and to cast away anything that re- resembles biblical truth. That's why abortion is legal in Australia. That's why uh, the homosexuals can get married because they know it's against the Bible. It's not like they thought, hey, this was a wonderful idea. No, they know what the Word of God says and they say, hey, let's do the opposite. Let's do the opposite. That's exactly what's going through their mind. That's the reality of kings, presidents, and prime ministers in this world. So don't be surprised, and I know we can be frustrated at it, but don't be surprised when they bring in new laws that are against the Word of God. Right? You know, they they bring in new laws, they do new things, it's like, man, don't they know what the Bible says? Well, they know what the Bible says, and that's why they're doing the opposite. Because that's what God's telling us. They take counsel against the Lord and against His anointed. Okay? There's, they're not atheists. Okay? They, these, these, these powers that be, they're not atheists. They know there's God. They know there's Jesus Christ. They know these, this is true. And they're purposely trying to do away with the laws of God and the commandments of God. You might say, well, Kevin, that sounds, you know, conspiratorial. You know, it sounds like conspiracies. We don't see this openly. Well, that's what the Word of God says. They take counsel together. They're against the Lord. You know, you, you believe the media or you believe the Word of God. It's up to you. You know? Um, <clears throat> you know, God is telling us that the world powers are actively working toward wanting a new world order which does not reflect biblical, biblical Christianity in any way. You know? And you might say, well, Kevin, I've never heard them speaking against God. I've never heard them speaking against Jesus Christ. Well, God says they do. (laughs) God tells us, yes, that's exactly what they're doing. They take counsel together. They're speaking against God. They're speaking against Jesus Christ. Sometimes that counsel is is done openly, right? It's covered by the media, okay? Sometimes it is done, you know, the the United Nations, when they meet together, or, you know, sometimes you can see, um, I forget the political channel on TV, which covers what's going on in in government house and and when, when when they're talking. Yeah, that's all done openly, you know, yeah, they're not talking against God and against Christ in those councils. But what this tells me, if the Word of God is true, that tells me that behind the scenes, behind the scenes, they're taking counsel together. Behind the scenes, they're getting together. You know, labor, labor leadership, liberal leadership, getting together. Who knows, playing golf together, coming up. How can we, you know, progress uh, this new world on, order agenda? How can we progress against Christianity and against the Bible? It's been done in secret. You know, there's no other way. You think you see openly what you see on TV and the media? No. They're doing other counsel together behind the scenes against God and against the anointed. 
It stands behind closed doors. And again, there's no such thing as atheists when it comes to these people. They know very well that God exists and that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. They want to do away with that. But look at verse number four. God laughs. So first thing I want you to pick up from the verses that we, we read is that God hears. God sees, God hears what these people are doing. Yes, it's behind closed doors. They take counsel together. We don't necessarily see what's going on. But God sees it. God hears it, right? And then what does he do in verse number four? God laughs. God laughs at them. God laughs them to scorn. Verse number four. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Now, what does derision mean? That means they're being derided. They're being made fun of. They're being mocked. God looks at these men and mocks and laughs at them. Now, this is a side of God that most churches aren't going to tell you about. You know, God, you know, is, is you know, is love and he, of course, he is and he's long-suffering and he's merciful and he's gracious. And, of course, all those things are true. But when it comes to wicked leaders, when it comes to wicked governments of this world, the wicked powers that be, God sits in heavens and mocks them. La not laughs like, ha-ha, laughing with them. No, laughing at them, okay? Laughing at them that they think that they can do away with God, they can do away with Christ. Not so. God laughs at them, laughs at the evil plans of these world powers, mocks them. Uh, so, you know, there's, there's no need for us to be afraid. You know, we see these laws come into place and go, man, I can't believe it, against the Lord, against... You know, this could bring persecution to Christians. You know, we might, you know if, if, if it's ever illegal to knock doors and preach the gospel, if it's ever illegal to get together, and you know, in some parts of the world, it is illegal to get together and have church, unless it's officially, you know, done through the, through the government you know, system. But then you're forced to preach on what they want you to preach, you know. And that's why, you know, in China and some other countries, they have churches, un, you know, underground churches, you know, hidden churches, of fear that they would be persecuted. But we should not fear if the laws of our nation or the laws of this world are against Christians. Why? Because our God's laughing at it. You know, our, our God that we worship, the God that loves us so much, He came and sent Jesus Christ to die for us, saved us from our sins, saved us from hell, that same God that we love and that we worship, that we sing praises to, the same God is laughing at them. He, he thinks it's all a joke. He, he, can't, he can't believe these kings are trying to take power and authority in this world away from himself. You know, God still sits on that throne. God still holds all authority in his hands. God is in control. But then, so God hears what they're saying, God laughs, and then God responds. God responds in verse number five. <coughs> verse number five. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath. Now, would you like to face the wrath of God? Okay, so, you know, this just proves to you that God's not laughing with them. He's laughing at them. He's mocking them, right? Then he says, he shall speak to them in his wrath. God's angry at them. God hates the wicked, okay? God hates wickedness. He speaks to them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. So obviously it displeases the Lord that this institution of government that he wants for the world is actively going against him, going against Christ, going against the laws of God, going against Christians, persecuting his people. It displeases the Lord, and the Lord will speak to them in his wrath. Man, I would never want the Lord to speak to me in his wrath. Right? I mean, I'm glad I'm covered by the righteousness of Christ. Right? You know, uh, uh, otherwise, you know, those that have not received Christ, those that hate the Lord, they're going to face the wrath of God. And then what, what does it say here? Well, basically, he shall speak to them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. I want you to notice there that this is the Father speaking. Because I, what I think what you realize here in this, in this chapter is that when God responds, the Father speaks, then the Son speaks, and then the Holy Spirit speaks. In all, all of this in this chapter, right? So the Father says, you know, he shall speak to them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Then he says this, the Father says this in verse number six. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. So, you know, God's laughing at these kings, the kings of the earth, and as his response is, I'm going to set my king. You know, who's this king? It's the anointed, it's, it's Messiah, it's Christ. He said, I, I have set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. Now, 
this is a reference to Christ, because Christ is going to come back. We've been you know, listening to sermons recently about this. The second coming of Christ is going to come, destroy the Antichrist, destroy the beast, destroy the armies that go up against him, and set up his millennial kingdom, right? He's the king of kings and he's the lord of lords. And uh, one of the questions that might come up is, what is Zion? You know, we read about Zion so, much, so many times in the Bible. It's mentioned over a hundred times, I believe, uh, throughout the Bible, especially the Old Testament. Uh, it's covered more in the Old Testament than it is in the New Testament. But Zion is basically, it, it's, it's a progressive term. It changes. It's not always the same location. But the first mention of Zion, you don't need to turn there, I'll just read it to you. The first mention of Zion is in 2 Samuel chapter 5, and I'll just read to you verses 6 and 7. The Bible says, and the king and his men... So this is, this is after David has become the king of Israel. Okay? So you know, obviously, there was Saul before him. And then before Saul, the, the judges ruled um, uh, in, in Israel. They were the ones that called the shots. So this is much later after Israel has gone into the land of Canaan. And then David is set up as the king. In verse number 6, And the king and his men went to Jerusalem unto the Jebusites. So Jerusalem was, was once inhabited by these people called the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, which spake unto David, saying, Except thou take away the blind and the lame, thou shalt not come in hither, thinking David cannot come hither. So, you know, David's coming against them. They're in war, and they're saying to David, the only people you can defeat are the blind and the lame. You're not going to come in here. You're not going to come to Jerusalem. <clears throat> and then I, I love verse 7. Because I'll just, like, I'll just read verse 6 again, where it says, thinking, this is what they're thinking, David cannot come in hither. There's no way David can, can come into Jerusalem. And then verse 7, Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion, the same as the city of David. Like, that's it. Like the one. <laughs> so you have the Jebusites, like, they're so sure that King David is not going to be able to come and take over Jerusalem. You know, you, you, the only people you can defeat are the blind and the lame. And then, like, in one sentence, yeah, David took over it, you know. It's like, with the power of God, you know, it's done. I just love how it's just one word, you know. We don't, we don't see the, the fight that takes place. Um, but we see David took, hold, uh, took the stronghold of Zion. So Zion, the first mention of Zion is this stronghold, is this fortress in Jerusalem, where the armies, obviously the barracks, I guess, of, of the armies of the Jebusites, went up against David and against his armies. They, over, they, they defeated them. Zion, at this reference here, is that stronghold is that, uh, is that um, fortress. Okay? And then it says, the same is the city of David. The same is the city of David. So Jerusalem now is being referenced as the city of David. Now, where have you heard that term before, the city of David? It's a reference to Jerusalem, but it's a reference to another city. We've just had Christmas, and if you remember what it said, that when Jesus was born in Bethlehem, that he was born in the city of David. I don't know if you remember that reference. Um, or if you've read, you know, <clears throat> but basically Bethlehem is the city of David because that's where he was born and Jerusalem is the city of David because that's the city that he took over, he, he defeated and that became, Jerusalem became the capital of Israel, okay? So both, both, both t uh, the city and the town are referenced as the city of David, which is obviously interesting because Jesus, uh, Jesus who's the seed of David, Jesus who's the descendant of David, obviously, as well, was born in Bethlehem, was born in the city of David. And that's why, if you remember, when, when, when Jesus sat on the, the, um, the donkey, sat on the, at the ass, and was going into Jerusalem, they were going into Jerusalem, the people were rejoicing, right? They thought the kingdom was coming. They thought Christ was going to set up his kingdom right now. Why? Because it pictured King David, right? King David was born in Bethlehem. Jesus was born in Bethlehem. King David went and took, you know, took over Jerusalem, Remember, in that time, Israel was um, governed by um, uh, uh, Rome, governed by, yeah, by Rome, by the Roman Empire. And so when they saw Jesus going into Jerusalem, they thought Christ is going to bring the kingdom. He's, go he's doing the exact same thing that King David did. Defeated the enemies, defeated the Jebusites back in David's day, going to defeat that Roman Empire. But of course, no, that week that he, he went there was to die on the cross for our sins. Christ is going to come back. God is promising us that he's going to set up his king one day in that holy hill of Zion. Now, so Zion started as this fortress, became known as the city. And you might also be familiar with the term Mount Zion. Now, Mount Zion, because like I said, it kind of changes. But 
Jerusalem is, is surrounded or, or covered parts of it of seven hills, seven mountains. One of those mountains was Mount Zion. Now, I had a look geographically to find out which one it is, and it's disputed. Like, you, you won't even know really which mount it is that's referenced as Mount Zion. Um, but it, it's one of those mounts in, in uh, Jerusalem today. Uh, so you've got Mount Zion, you've got the fortress called Zion, you've got Jerusalem called Zion, but then Judah. So after Israel was divided in the northern and the southern kingdom, Judah, the southern kingdom, became known as Zion as well. I'll just read it to you from uh, Zechariah chapter 9, verse 13. Zechariah 9, 13. When I have bent Judah for me, filled the bowl with Ephraim, and raised up thy sons, O Zion, against thy sons, O Greece, and made thee as the mighty sword of a mighty sorry, made thee as the sword of a mighty man. So when I have bent Judah for me, referring to Judah, filled the bow with Ephraim and raised up thy sons, O Zion. So Zion is Judah, the southern kingdom, being referenced there as well. Okay? So th these are references to the Old Testament. I just want to show you what Zion is. Because if you're like me, I like to find out what things mean. And then when you find these inconsistencies, you kind of go, well, why is that? Well, it's a progressive term, right? The fortress, the mount, the city, then all of Judah is referenced as Zion. But that's not the end of Zion, because Zion is mentioned in the New Testament as well. Turn to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22. What is Zion in the New Testament? Now, you probably know this, right? You probably know that a lot of the things in the Old Testament, a lot of the things in the Old Covenant are pictures of something spiritual, right? You know, the, 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 bron the, the, the serpent being raised, um, the bronze serpent being raised, healing the people of Israel from their snake venom bites, right? That was just a picture of Christ being raised in the New Testament, right? You know, the priests going in and doing the sacrifices Again, a picture of Christ and his sacrifice. You know, um, the, the picture of, of uh, Israel going through the Red Sea. You know, when, they, when, they, when the Red Sea was, was uh, opened and they, they walked through that Red Sea, the New Testament says that's a picture of baptism. They were baptized, in a sense. You know, it's a picture of something spiritual. And so Zion in the New Testament, we see Zion in the Old Testament, which is Israel and Judah, that's just a picture of something greater. And that's Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22. <clears throat> but ye are come unto Mount Zion. So Zion is just the Zion, same thing. Ye are come unto Mount Zion, and are unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. Do you guys remember what the heavenly Jerusalem is? The new heavens and the new earth? When the new Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem, descends from heaven? That is the real Zion. That is the heavenly Zion. That is the Zion of heaven. When he says, I'm going to set my, my, uh, a king upon the holy hill of Zion, he's referring to the end times, right? Of course, the, he, Christ is going to come and rule from Jerusalem in the millennium. Don't get me wrong. But all of these things are pictures of what's to come in the end times. Look at verse 23. To the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. So this Mount Zion, which the church of the uh, General Assembly are part of, right now is in heaven. Okay? But once Christ reigns in his millennium, once God creates this new heaven and new earth, that Mount Zion, that new Jerusalem is going to come and descend to the earth. So we see God, God's plan, right? He sees the kings now. He sees how corrupt they are. He sees that they hate the, work, the way of God. And his plan is, obviously, to bring his own king uh, and bring Mount Zion with him, which is that new heavenly Jerusalem. That's the end goal. That's the plan. This chapter is actually about the end times. Okay? Now, that's, we've seen the Father speak. Look at verse... If you can go back to Psalm 2. Go back to Psalm 2. Now we're going to see Jesus speaking. We're going to see the Son speak. Psalm 2, verse 7. Psalm 2, verse 7. Jesus speaking, I will declare the decree the Lord hath said unto me. So the Lord that was speaking is now saying something to me, saying something to somebody, right? What, did, what does it say? Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Do you see how these are the words of Christ? The Father is saying to the Son, 
Thou art uh, my son, this day have I begotten thee. But it's Jesus telling us that that's what the Lord has said unto him. You see? So these are the words of Christ. I will declare the decree, the Lord hath said unto me, me being Jesus Christ, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Now this is the, the first reference that you're going to get of Jesus Christ as the begotten son of God. Because obviously in the New Testament, I'm sure you know many references where Christ is called the begotten of the Father, the begotten Son. You know, John 3.16, uh, the only begotten Son. Now, I wanted to cover this very quickly. Well, maybe not so quickly. But a lot of people don't understand when we reference Jesus Christ as the begotten Son, there's a lot of confusion. And even I was confused um, some years ago, right? Because a lot of, because when we talk about, like, my kids, like, like Nicholas, who's playing the piano, he's my begotten son, right? So, you know, there was a time when he was born, and, you know, he's come from, from me, he's come from my wife, he's our begotten son, right? And sometimes people mistakenly refer to Jesus Christ as the begotten son in reference to his birth, in reference to his birth in Bethlehem, okay? Now, I, I understand the confusion, I understand it, uh, but what you'll, when you walk down that path, what you'll come to conclude is that Christ was not always the Son of God. You're going to conclude that Christ at some point, you know, 2,000 years ago in Bethlehem, when he was born, that's when he was begotten of the Father as far as the Son of God, right? And that's why some people, some people teach, some churches teach that Christ was not always the Son um, and then he won't, he won't always be the Son either. Like he was just the Son while he was on the earth and then... You know, at some point in the future, he's no longer the son. And uh, no, so I want you to understand what it means to be begotten. And we're going to, this phrase actually is referenced three times in the New Testament. Okay? And if you remember what I mentioned to you last time is that the psalm is heavily, heavily quoted in the New Testament. Turn to Hebrews chapter 1. I would, I would keep a finger in Psalms 2 because, you know, we're going back to Psalms 2. We, we, uh, but Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 4. Because this phrase from the Father to the Son is something that glorifies Jesus Christ. It's something that uplifts Christ. Okay, and I want to show you all three references here. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 4. Being made so much better than the angels, referring to Christ, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. So it's exalting Christ above the angels here. Verse 5. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. See, that's from Psalm 2. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. So these are words he's never said to angels. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, who's the first begotten? Who's the begotten son? Jesus Christ. He saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. Let all the angels worship him. The first thing I want you to notice that's borrowing from Psalm chapter 2 is that this reference of, of uh, Christ being the begotten of the Father is to exalt him above the angels. Okay? Christ is not just an angel. He's not just some heavenly host, some created being. No, he is the Son of God, okay? and he existed before the angels. He has a more excellent name before the angels to the point that the angels worship him. The angels worship the Son. Okay? Now go to Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 1. So Jesus Christ is not just some angel. Okay? Hebrews chapter 5, verse 1. Obviously, we know Christ is God. Okay? Hebrews chapter 5, verse 1. For every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. So it's talking about the priest given the sacrifices for sins. And it's referencing the Old Testament high priest. We'll see that in a second. Verse 2. Who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way, for that he himself also is compassed with infirmity. And by reason hereof he ought, as for the people, so also for himself to offer for sins. And no man taketh this honour unto himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. Okay, so no priest, no high priest decided to call himself the high priest. Okay, they were ordained by God. Aaron in verse 3 was ordained, verse 4 was ordained by God to be that high priest for Old Testament Israel to offer those sacrifices. Right, 
But then look at verse 5. So also, Christ glorified not himself. Christ did not come and glorify himself. Remember, he came in humility. He made himself a little lower than the angels when he came to this earth, right? He put aside the glory of heaven. He put aside the worship of the heavenly host. He became a man. But then it says, He also Christ glorified not himself to, to be made in high priest, but he that said unto him, so the person that glorified him is the one that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. Okay? So Christ did not come to glorify himself. The Father glorified Christ. Okay? We get that from verse number 5. In verse number 1, we see that the Father glorifies Christ above the angels as well. The angels come and worship the Son. Now at this point, I've still not, not shown you exactly what it means to be begotten, but I just want to show you that this is a phrase that glorifies Jesus Christ. The Father loves to refer to Christ as His begotten Son because it brings glory to Christ. Okay? And that's why I hate those modern Bible versions that take away the begotten nature of Christ Right? It's just the only Son of God rather than the begotten Son of God. They're taking away glory that God the Father has put upon the Son. That's why you stick to your King James Bible, because it's perfect, it's right. It glorifies Jesus Christ. Now, turn to Acts 13. Acts 13. Let's understand what it means to be the begotten of the Father. Acts 16. Sorry, Acts 13. Acts 13, verse 30. Acts 13, verse 30. Acts 13, verse 30. But God raised him from the dead. Who did God raise? Jesus Christ from the dead, right? We're talking about his resurrection. And he was seen many days of them which came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses unto the people. And we declare unto you glad tidings, how, how that the promise which was made unto the fathers, God hath fulfilled the same unto us, their children, in that he hath raised up Jesus again, so the, the resurrection, as it is also written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Which day did God begat Jesus Christ? The day of the resurrection. Do you see that? When Christ was resurrected from the dead, raised up Jesus from the dead, that is when the second psalm is fulfilled. That is the day where God says to his son, Thou art my son, Thou art my son in the sense that that's, that's his position with the Father. Okay? It's not like he became the son. He is the son, but it's this day, the day of his resurrection, that I have begotten thee, says the Father. So when we refer to Jesus Christ as the begotten of the Father, it's not when he was born of a ma in the manger. It's not when he was born as a baby. The begotten nature of Christ is his resurrection. That's when he was glorified as well. Okay? He received his glorified, resurrected body at that point. That is the reference of the begotten of the Father. Let me just read to you Revelation 1 verse 5. Why is that important? Revelation verse, chapter 1 verse 5 says this, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Now, Christ, who is God, who is the creator of all things, we know John 1, when we had it read earlier, you know, um, the Word was God, and the, uh, uh, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then what did it, what did it say in verse 3? I'll just turn there quickly. John chapter 1, verse 3. I wish I had it memorized. All things, referring to the Word, referring to Jesus Christ, all things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. So everything that was created on this world, on this earth, all the life was made by Jesus Christ. Okay? He gets all the glory of creation. The Father has allowed that to be, that the Son gets the glory for creation. It's Christ that created all things. But not only does He get the glory for creation, for the new life, but Christ is also the first begotten of the dead. He gets all the glory of someone that was once dead and is made alive. Okay? He gets all the glory of our salvation because we were all once dead, once spiritually dead, without Christ. 
and He gets the glory. He is the first begotten of the Father. And so we, in Christ, can be born again. We, in Christ, can have new life. We, in Christ, can have that new revived spirit in us. And eventually, in Christ, as His resurrected body, uh, once it was, uh, His glorified resurrected body, we too, in Christ, will have that new body. But Christ was the first to have those things. And through Him, we too can have all that. That's why He's the first begotten of the dead also. He's brought everything into this world, but then us who have died spiritually, He gives us that, that, uh, that new life. Okay, through Him. He's, he gets all the glory. There's, there's no one else that gets the glory of creation and gets the glory of the new life. Okay, the eternal life. <coughs> now, I just wanted to read something to you um, from the NIV. Okay, so the NIV, uh, you know, this day have I begotten thee, reads this. In the NIV it says, You are my son, today I have become your father. That's what the NIV says. Today have I become your father. What does that, what does that say? That means there was a time where Jesus was not the son and the father was not his father. Okay, that's what the NIV, NIV, NIV says. So, and it does apply this also to the resurrection, so they got that bit right. But then that's saying that at the resurrection of Christ, that's when Christ became the Son of the Father and the Father became His Son. No. Do you see how, how these modern versions bring in false teaching? God the Father makes a statement, Thou art my Son. It's not you've become my Son. No, you are my Son. That's your position. That's your eternal position. You know, Micah 5 2 says, But thou, Bethlehem Ephrathah, through, uh, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose going forth have been from old, from everlasting. That's a prophecy of Christ. Christ comes from everlasting. He didn't become the Son at some point. He's not a created being. He's not just an angel. He's the glorified God. That's who he is. He's the Son of God. Okay? So please, if you've got your modern version, get rid of those modern versions. It's going to bring heresy and false doctrine into your, into, into your life. Now, another false teaching that I've heard is, I've heard people say this, um, it's possible to be saved by just believing on Jesus. Now, that, that sounds good, but you know, obviously when we preach the gospel, the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection, okay? So what we preach is not just Jesus Christ, but the fact that he came to die on the cross for our sins, and then he rose again from the dead, right? We want them to believe the whole gospel, but there are some that will tell you, no, you don't need to believe the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. You just have to believe in Jesus. You just have to trust Him. And not, you don't even need to know about His death, burial, and resurrection. Now, the reason, and, and I've heard this said, um, I've heard this not personally, but I've seen this on, like, on YouTube on some videos and stuff. And the reason for that is they turn to John 3.16. I'll just read it to you. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life right? So there he goes, well, where does it say there that Christ was, was crucified and died for our sins and rose again from the dead, right? And so they say, well, if, if we believe John 3, 16, the, you know, the cross is not even referenced. His death, burial, and resurrection is not even referenced. So it's possible to just believe on Jesus. Yeah, but here's what you don't understand. That he gave his only begotten son. And what does it mean to be the begotten son? It's that he was resurrected. John 3, 16 is referencing that Christ would die and would be resurrected. right? Because they don't understand what it means to be the begotten Son. The begotten Son is a reference to Him being raised from the dead, not born in Bethlehem's manger. That's not when He was begotten. Okay? Now, is it true that before His resurrection we're going to read about Him being the begotten Son? He's going to be late? Of course. John 3.16 is a proof of that. All right? But it's just like anything. Like you might say, well, why was he called the begotten son before he was resurrected? Well, it's like, well, you know, Christ was crucified 2,000 years ago, and yet the Bible tells us he's a lamb slain from the foundation of the world, right? That as far as God is, God's internal. Christ is the begotten son. God knew, of course, that Christ would be crucified on the cross. That's what he is, right? He's the lamb of God that take, that take away the sin of the world, said John the Baptist. But he hadn't died for the sin. He hadn't shed his blood just yet when he said those words. Okay, so... Just understand that, you know, John 3.16 does cryptically have the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ because it referenced there the begotten Son. And again, that's why the NIV have messed it up. They take away that word and they don't even, it's like they don't even know what it means, you know. 
But I don't want you guys to be ignorant. I want you guys to understand what it means to be the begotten Son of the Father. Back to Psalm chapter 2. Psalm 2. <coughs> Psalm 2 verse 8. <coughs> Psalm 2 verse 8. So this is Jesus. He continues speaking. He says, Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron, Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, here's what's interesting. We know this is a reference to Christ. We know when he comes back in the millennium, he's going to reign over the kings, reign over the world, with a rod of iron. Now, here's what, here's what I find funny. The kings of the earth counsel together against the Lord, against the Word, against His laws, right? completely against God, completely against Christ, you know, aiming to bring in that, that Antichrist at the end of, you know, at the, end of the world. But when Christ comes, he's going to undo it all. He's going to do, undo all their work and rule with a rod of iron. What's he going to rule from? The Word of God, right? The judgments, the righteousness, the commandments of the Word of God. These kings that are trying to get rid of it, Christ, in one day when he returns, is going to rule with a rod of iron, bring that back into this world. So whatever they're planning to do, that's why God's laughing. Because God says, I've got my king, and he's going to bring it, and he's going to rule you guys with a rod of iron. But here's the thing. Notice what Jesus says in verse 8. Ask of me, he's speaking to us, ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, I'm going to read to you Revelation 2. If you guys want to turn there, you can, because there's a, there's a reference here very, uh, very similar to Psalm uh, chapter 2. Revelation 2, verse 26. Revelation 2, 26. Because you might be going, oh, Kevin, no, that's not about us ruling with a rod of iron. That's just Jesus Christ. No, Christ is going to give some of us that authority to rule with a rod of iron as well. Revelation chapter 2, verse 26 says, This is Christ speaking to the churches. <clears throat> and he that overcometh... So what does it mean to overcome? To be saved? We've, we've covered that before. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, so that those that do great works for Jesus Christ, to him will I give power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter uh, shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received my father. So even as the father gives me the authority over the nations to rule with a rod of iron, so too am I going to give it to those people that have overcome, those that are saved, and that have done great works, great rewards. There's going to be great rewards for those. You've done great things for God. Some of, us, some of us, hopefully all of us, I don't know, are going to be able to rule one day with that rod of iron over, over the earth. It's a, it's a great honor. It's, a, it's, a, it's amazing, you know. Quite often you hear about Christ ruling with a rod of iron. No, it's going to be believers as well ruling and reigning with him. <clears throat> yeah, and so I just find it funny that the kings, they're trying to get away from the word of God. One day, bang. <laughs> when they say peace and safety, that sudden destruction comes upon them. Christ later will come and bring his kingdom. It's all over for them and we're going to have righteousness upon this earth. Look at Psalm 2, verse 10. Psalm 2, verse 10. Now, I believe this is now the Spirit that speaks, the Holy Spirit. Psalm 2, verse 10. Because why? Because the Bible was written by men that were moved by the Holy Ghost, right? So the Holy Ghost is the narrator of the Bible. Then what does it say here in verse uh, 10? Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. So is there still a chance for these corrupt kings? Yes, there's still a chance, right? They're not all corrupt. The government, there are legitimate politicians that are just trying their best, right? There are legitimate politicians that fear the Lord and want to make sure, you know, they do the best they can for their people. The Holy Spirit speaks to these people and says, Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings, be instructed. Where are they going to get their instruction from? From the council of their mates? The council of the kings? No. You take instruction from the word of God, right? He says, be wise. Uh, Proverbs 15, verse 33. For the fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom, and before honor is humility. The fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom. So these kings that ought to be instructed first need the fear of God in their lives, right? And then it says there, and before honor is humility. They need humility. There's too many politicians and prime ministers and presidents full of pride, 
full of themselves, looking at the kingdoms that they believe they've, they, 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 they've got, right? That's why their hearts are far from the Lord. The Holy Spirit is telling these kings, get humble, get instructed by the Word of God. When you bring in the laws, take the laws of God and bring them into your nation. That's what brings righteousness. And I had a look at the Australian Constitution, the, the Australian Constitution of, in 1900, right? Um, and these are some of the first words we read in the Australian Constitution. It says, Whereas the people of New South Wales, Victoria, South Australia, Queensland, and Tasmania humbly, humbly relying on the blessing of Almighty God have agreed to unite in one undissolvable federal commonwealth under the crown of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland and under the constitution hereby established. So when our government, when our, president, you know, our, our leaders put together the constitution so we can be a federal nation in 1900, what, what, are they the same kind of politicians that we have today? No, they say we come humbly before the Almighty God. Now, were they saved? I don't know. I don't know if they were Christians or saved, but at least they had the fear of God in them. At least they were humbly enough to say, hey, God, we need your help. You know, we're going to establish this nation. You know, we need the laws of God. We need to come before you and seek your guidance. You know, I, I thank God that at least the United States, you know, the politicians, you know, at least still reference God Almighty. And yes, I know their hearts are far from him and they're just giving him lip service. I understand that. But, you know, in Australia, when's the last time you've heard the Prime Minister honour Christ, honour honor God, be humble, hum, humble himself before, before the Word of God? We don't see that in our politicians. You know? They've moved away from the instruction of God and they've taken the counsel amongst themselves and against the Lord. <clears throat> Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2. Keep your finger in Psalm 2. 1 Timothy, Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. You know, and, and so we can get frustrated by, by the government, we can get frustrated by the kings and the prime ministers, but we see that the Holy Ghost is still telling them, hey, there's still a chance. Be wise. Take instruction. Kings, right? Judges of the earth, take instruction. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. We see that the Holy Ghost is still urging these kings to, you know, th there's still some there that, that can, you know, serve the Lord. And so we're instructed in 1 Timothy chapter 2 to pray for our government, to pray for our rulers, to pray for the kings. 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 1, <clears throat> I exhort therefore that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, all men, verse 2, for kings and for all that are in authority, why? Why do we want to pray for these kings? Why do we want to pray for these politicians so they can continue to serve us forever, so they can get their huge paychecks and they can continue to bring in ungodly laws so they would you know, be assured of being voted in in the next election? Is that what we're praying for? No. Verse 2 says we're praying for them that we, that we as Christians may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. So what we're praying for is not that they would have a successful career, that they would be lifted in pride and, and be, you know, uh, you know, be remembered as the greatest Prime Minister of Australia. No, we pray that God will instill fear of God into their hearts, that they would, you know, govern this nation with the laws of God, that they would leave our Christian liberty alone, that they would let us as Christians serve the Lord so we can be in peace. It's, it's for our sake that we pray for the kings. You might say, Kevin, I don't want to pray for our government. No, you don't understand. You're, you're praying so we can live in peace, so our children can grow up in a nation, that they can continue to serve the Lord. And I know things are going to deteriorate. I know that things are getting worse and worse. But we still, at least in Australia, we still have freedom. We still have Bibles. We still have, can have church. We can still knock doors and preach the gospel. Let's pray that, you know, God will make their path slippery if they try to stop these things and, you know, hopefully reverse their trend, bring back these laws of God against, against the wicked, against crime, so there can be at least some peace in this world, you know, as, as little as we can enjoy before, you know, all things turn, turn crazy with the Antichrist on the loose, you know? <clears throat> uh, verse 3 in 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Saviour. You want to be good and acceptable? 
You want to bring him pleasure? Then pray for the kings, pray for the government, right? So that we could live quiet and peaceful lives. Verse 4, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. So even these wicked kings that hate the Lord, you know, and God laughs at them, you know, unless they're reprobate, you know, but these people that are not, you know, going with the flow, God's still willing that all men to be saved. Like, it's still his desire for all men to be saved. It's still his desire that these kings would serve him in the right place, that the institution of government that God has placed uh, for them. <clears throat> now, go back to Psalm 2, just the last one, the last verse there, Psalm 2, verse 12. <coughs> the memory verse, Psalm 2, verse 12. Kiss the son, kiss the son, lest he be angry, and ye perish from the way, when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. So, you know, it says, you know, to, to these kings, you know, kiss the son. You know, what does, that, what does that mean? It's like, you know, where it says in the New Testament, greet each other with a holy kiss. It's just, it's greeting one another. It's honoring one another, right? It's say, bring, look, honor the son. Kiss the son, lest he be angry. Look, because God's wrath is being kindled, right? God's wrath is being built up. And we know that God will pour out his wrath one day on this earth before Christ comes and reigns and rules. And you perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. You know, you know I, I kind of sometimes think Australia and, and, and this world does need God's wrath to be kindled just a little, <laughs> right? Just, just a little, because like, even a little of his wrath is going to cause these people to perish in their way. Right? So, I mean, it just tells me how, my, how like, for, for things to continue the way they are, it just tells me that God is a gracious God, God is a merciful God, God is a, a God of long-suffering and very patient. His wrath is being built up. Man, if you just have his wrath kindled just a little bit, not even his whole wrath, just a little, these people would perish in their way, right? And I, I, kind, of, I kind of wish God would kindle his wrath a little, right? Just to, just to uh, destroy the wicked of this world and to bring fear, the fear of God, back into, into our, our lives. Um, <clears throat> And of course, you know, his wrath is going to be completely destroyed when the Antichrist comes. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 8, se oh, verse 7, I'll just read that to you quickly. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now let it let until he be taken out of the way, and then shall the wicked be revealed. Referring to the Antichrist, referring to the beast. Right? These kings are working together to bring in this one world government. One day this Antichrist, this wicked will be revealed, right? Because the, the mystery of iniquity is already working. It was working in the time of Paul. And that's why our, our nation is so ungodly. That's why our government is so ungodly, because they're still working to bring in this mystery of iniquity, referring to the beast, referring to the Antichrist. But then it says this, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. So when Christ comes, that millennial uh, war is going to destroy the beast, destroy the Antichrist, destroy the one world government to come. And that should assure us, because at, at the end of verse 12 it says, Blessed are the, all they that put their trust in Him. Okay, blessed are all they that put their trust in Him. There is still time for some rulers and some kings to do right. There is still time for them to have a fear of the Lord. For you guys, we are to put our trust in Him. It shouldn't upset us, it shouldn't worry us, it shouldn't concern us. God has revealed to us in His Word that... Things are going to wax worse and worse. This world's going to get worse. This world's going to become more ungodly. But we put our trust in Christ. We know God is laughing at them. We know God has a plan. We know Christ is going to come back and rule with a rod of iron. We know if we serve and work with Him, He's going to give us that opportunity to rule with a rod of iron as well. There's great things coming for us. You know, this isn't just some pipe dream. This isn't just some intangible vision. This is the truth of God's Word. One day Christ will be on this earth we are going to be on this earth with him in our new resurrected bodies and ruling and reigning with him. We put our trust in him. God knows what's going on. Don't feel like, oh, it's out of control. No, God knows exactly what's going on, laughing at them, mocking at them. But at the same time, as Christians, we ought to, you know, not, not just hate these people all the time, but also God says, hey, that he wants them to be saved as well. He wants them to, to turn. He wants them to fear the Lord. And so we, it doesn't matter what door we knock, one day we knock on the door of a politician we don't like, Hey, it's our job to give him the gospel, right? And hope that he gets saved, right? 
<clears throat> so we are not to be fearful. God wants us to trust him, even in the midst of this world that's turning their back on him. <clears throat> 